My name is Matt Howard. Uh, I was uh, also a Marine in the 1st Tank Battalion, 1st Division, 1st uh, Marine Division, stationed in 29 Palms, California. Um, you know, this is really interesting. I, I hadn't, I've been out of the Marine Corps for two years. I haven't thought about hazing in, uh, I can't even tell you when. And just listening to that testimony brought back many a painful memory. Um, I can corroborate everything that this Lance Corporal just said. Uh, the Marine Corps bases itself on dehumanization and subjugation and abuse of its lower enlisted uh, in order um, for it to function. And um, I myself, uh, while I certainly didn't plan on testifying about this, um, uh, I was also a victim of this. Uh, during boot camp, uh, I was beaten, um, experienced uh, what the Marines call a blanket party. Uh, anyone who's watched Full Metal Jacket uh, gets the idea. Uh, after the incident, uh, I was severely in injured um, and ended up being kicked out of my platoon for being beaten. Uh, also, um, a very dear friend of mine, Shane Swamberg, uh, was hazed. He was a, uh, a tow gunner in 1st Tank Battalion. Um, he was uh, the victim of a severe hazing incident, uh, which he reported and um, faced more retribution for reporting. Uh, so at that time, he was transferred to the battalion office uh, so he could uh, have a desk job and uh, be away from his platoon. Uh, during that time, uh, he had decided he had enough, and he started smoking marijuana and informed his chain of command of that fact in an attempt um, to remove himself uh, from the situation he found himself in. Uh, some cruel twist of fate, cruel irony, karma, I don't know what you want to call it. Um, his drug test actually came back negative. <laughs> yeah, well, smoking marijuana would have saved his life because then he went to Ramadi and was killed by indirect mortar fire. Anyway. Um your head, uh, pushing all the way to Baghdad. As we were lined up on the border between Iraq and Kuwait, um, in the first hours of the invasion, before the first hours of the invasion, uh, I was in my seven-ton vehicle, monitoring the battalion net, listening to the radio. Uh, at that time, uh, my friend, uh, Corporal Cameron White came running to my truck. Um, my radio actually wasn't working at the time. Uh, I was actually lucky to have a radio. Uh, there were many vehicles in my convoy that were not equipped with radios. Um, the radio I was equipped with uh, was outdated. Uh, it frequently became inoperable. Um, at that time, uh, that moment was one of those times. So. Corporal White came up and started screaming, hey man, you gotta hear what's going on on the radio. They're screaming, cease fire, cease fire, somebody just got hit. And um, I, I, I didn't know what to think. I, I, as um, a couple minutes passed, uh, word came down, uh, Captain Banning of Alpha Company, the first tank of the invasion that crossed the line of departure, he, was having some technical issues on his tank. And um, I believe uh, they had actually forgot to put in their night vision uh, in the driver's hole. And at that time, they went to traverse the main gun turret of the M1A1 tank, 
So now the tank, the main gun tube, is actually facing Kuwait. Um, at this time, a Marine gunship came up overhead and launched a Hellfire missile directly into the tank. Miraculously, everyone actually survived. Um, the forward observer on the tank received a shrapnel to his eye. But aside from that, uh, everyone did, did make it off the tank alive. Now, this is quite fearful for myself. I had just got done reading a book, uh, I believe it was called The General's War, which um, goes into great detail, uh, the planning and, and operation of the, of the first Gulf War. And in that book, it was, it was clearly laid out how the majority of all casualties in the first Gulf War were from friendly fire. There I was, not even over the border yet, captain of my company, first tank of the invasion, was blown up by his own Marines. Now, I actually tell this story not to point out the ineptness of the United States Marine Corps. Um, I actually um, use it as a segue to talk about the munitions that, that we used uh, in Tank Battalion, uh, and also um, in Marine Corps gunships and um, many other weapon systems as well. Uh, contained in that Hellfire missile was depleted uranium. Contained in the armor of that M1A1 tank was depleted uranium. Maximum exposure time for depleted uranium, or when you're most susceptible to exposure, is directly after impact. You should not be in the vicinity of a vehicle that was just hit by friendly fire. Um, I certainly don't have a science background. Uh, I won't get into the issue of depleted uranium too much. Uh, I expect you to do that uh, and do the research. But uh, I can speak briefly to the fact that this is the Agent Orange of this occupation. This weapon has no purpose in Iraq. Granted, this was during the initial invasion, um, so I, I maybe can understand its deployment. But let's be clear here. Depleted uranium is an anti-armor weapon. The Iraqis do not have armor. They don't have tanks. They don't have bombers. Why are we using this? And again, I urge you to do the research yourself. I can quickly say that we're using this because it's a, a way to get rid of atomic waste. We do not know what to do with that. We are poisoning our soldiers. We are poisoning the people of Iraq. But make no mistake, we are poisoning the world. I can test every single person in this room and I can find depleted uranium in your hair. I was tested myself personally. In Australia, I have begged the VA for testing. I received this letter recently. Dear Mr. Howard, I checked with a provider who has been with the VA and many branches of the services, and he does not know of any depleted uranium testing. I have put in a request for your dental visit, but it will be most likely only cover an evaluation for mouth jaw pain due to grinding teeth for PTSD. For routine cleaning, we would need a letter from your command that states you were due for routine dental work prior to leaving the service. Um, the VA has continually denied uh, my request to be tested for depleted uranium. Uh, this letter clearly shows that um, they're saying a test doesn't even exist. And I will say for the record, a test does exist. It's the wrong test. It's a urinalysis that's uh, used to de uh, detect exposure, immediate exposure. Uh, the problem with depleted uranium is that these particles dig deep within your body, and uh, you will not find them in your urine after a couple days. Uh, you need a very expensive test 
uh, one that the VA is certainly not willing to pay for. But I would also like to point out that the VA does recognize the danger of depleted uranium. While they might not want to test for it or talk about it or give us any briefings on it beforehand, I specifically rem remember st still holding this round. When we were issued uh, tank rounds in Kuwait, um, most of the tankers had never seen this weapon. Uh, they don't use it, at least the Marines don't use it in training, uh, probably because they don't, just have, they don't have the money for it um, compared to the other branches. But when we finally got to Kuwait and we're being issued this ammunition, um, I, I just so clearly remember these Marines coming up and saying, hey, Howard, will you take my picture? Will you take my picture? They wanted the picture of them holding the Black Widow because this is the first time that they ever got to actually have their hands on it. And this was a depleted uranium sable round that went in a tank. That round on impact aerosols and vaporizes and these particles go up in the air and that's why I was saying I can test every single one of you for depleted uranium and find it in your hair. These particles blow up into the atmosphere and are disseminating, disseminated all around the entire globe. They have found depleted uranium on the skin of NASA vehicles in space. We are changing the entire genome of our planet. Human beings, cats and dogs, plants. We are changing the genetic makeup of our planet by using these munitions in Iraq and Afghanistan. And as I said, the VA does recognize the danger albeit in a different way. That we, I'm holding here a depleted uranium questionnaire um, that I had to download from the VA. I certainly never saw this in, um, in Iraq. And it says, um, did you enter an Abrams tank, battle tank to retrieve sensitive items immediately after it was struck by friendly fire? Why do they ask this question? Because they know how dangerous a situation that is. And my best friend, Lance Corporal Greg Strell, did exactly that. He entered an Abrams battle tank to retrieve sensitive items immediately after it was struck by friendly fire. And those sensitive items did not need to be retrieved. The tank was already destroyed. In fact, there were live rounds still on that tank. The, my command that ordered him to retrieve those sensitive items put, him, put his life at risk. Those rounds could have cooked off. And not only that, they weren't that sensitive to begin with. Another hellfire could have been launched into that tank and we could have moved on. Instead, he was ordered to stay on that tank for an extended period of time and was exposed to depleted uranium in the process. Um, I'd like to also speak to the, the first casualty of the war while we're talking about munitions. Uh, I was next to Staff Sergeant Alva, um, uh, a gay man serving in the Marine Corps who stepped on a US-made cluster bomblet. We had pulled into a hasty Iraq, Iraq um, artillery site. Um, as we went into the site, we immediately started to dismount our vehicles. At that time, I heard an explosion to my back off to the left. I immediately heard Corman up. Then came a second explosion. Then my gunner came to my truck holding one of these bomblets. First casualty of the war was from the US. We had bombed this artillery site the night before, and they had stepped on unexploded ordnance. This is why there is a movement in the world not to use these weapons. <laughs> because they know that they have an unbelievably high unexploded rate. And that if it's not a child that picks it up to play with it, a lot of times they're actually fluorescent yellow and look like tennis balls. If it's not a child, then it's gonna be a Marine. 
What I saw in Iraq was just an intense disrespect for the country that we were invading. We treated this country like it was our own personal cesspool. The whole way to Baghdad, we threw trash out the windows. We defecated in the streets. The first building I got to in, in Baghdad was the UN building, the UN headquarters. It no longer exists. It was razed to the ground by, um, by an attack a couple weeks after we left. We got to this building, and it had been swept through a couple days prior by another Marine unit. This building was destroyed. File cabinets were, were tipped over. Um, computers were smashed. Uh, there was spray paint on the walls. Um, Again, people had defecated in the hallways. This was the culture. This was the attitude that we had. This was the way we conducted ourselves. This was the UN headquarters building. Now, to my command's credit, uh, we were actually ordered to help clean up that building when we got there. But what I saw absolutely disgusted me. When I was um, being set to uh, deploy or should I say, when we were set to uh, invade, uh, at the last minute they gave me a pallet of humanitarian rations on my truck. Um, you've heard in other testimony, a lot of people received such rations during the initial invasion. Clearly marked humanitarian. When we got over the border, um, as you've also heard, there was plenty of Iraqi children begging for food. I instantly, putting one and one together to make two, started handing out uh, the humanitarian rations. No sooner did I start handing out those rations than my first sergeant came up to me and in un no uncertain terms made it crystal clear that I was under direct orders not to throw out any more food to any more Iraqi children. Word was that General Mattis commander of the 1st Marine Division, did not want to give the Iraqis the wrong impression about why we were there. To make a long story short, I got all the way to Baghdad. I got all the way back to Kuwait, finally. And I still had this food on my truck. And I went to my command and I said, what am I to do with the humanitarian rations? And he said, bury it. And I did. I buried it in a garbage pit in Kuwait. I'd like to read an appeal from the, um, a response to my appeal uh, from the commanding officer, 1st Tank Battalion. Um, and this is about some allegations that I, I approached my chain of command with. Um, the colonel goes on to say that he, being myself, makes a number of comments addressing the leadership of the NCOs and officers of the Motor Transportation Platoon. I am concerned about the platoon's morale. I am awaiting the results of a recent command climate survey, and I have counseled the platoon commander and company commander on my expectations. Several indicators have surfaced that the platoon has immature NCO leadership and a lack of supervision by officers and staff NCOs. For example, NCOs have not been requiring Marines to stand at the position of attention while addressing them. This has been addressed. Additionally, the staff NCOs and officers have not been present at several platoon formations and PT formations. This has been addressed as well. Additionally, Marines have been conducting police call at 0530, which is the earliest time I expect Reveille to be sounded, and are not always being provided time to shave prior to PT or eat after PT. I am keeping a close eye on the platoon and its leaders. He states that there were sappy plates in warehouses during the war. These are our armored protection. Um, we had warehouses filled with them in California. I did not receive one uh, in Iraq. I have asked him for evidence of this. He has failed to produce it. He states that he had a broken gas mask in Iraq while equipment was available in garrison. I have asked him for evidence of this. He has failed to produce it. He states that he was threatened with a court martial for feeding civilians. I told him, he better learn how to follow orders. I have counseled PFC Howard on his First Amendment rights vis-a-vis -vis mutiny and fostering an atmosphere prejudicial to good order and discipline. He has been counseled on displaying anti-war propaganda in his barracks and literature critical of the president, including buttons, including buttons accusing the president. <laughs> including Buttons uh, accusing the president of being a war criminal. I've counseled him personally. 
I've counseled him personally on allegations that he's attempting to recruit Marines from the battalion to join him in a conscientious objector movement. I have told him that if he wants to claim conscientious objection status, that he needs to stop voicing his criticisms of the war around Marines, but help is available to him through his chain of command. Finally, well, I'm over time, I apologize. Um, you know, the, just, the, the list goes on and on. Uh, back in the rear, being ordered to destroy parts. Uh, this was happened frequently uh, in uh, our supply elements. I remember specifically uh, being ordered to, to destroy uh, Humvee exhaust pipe so we, we could order more. Um, it was brand new, and I had to take a sledgehammer to it. Um, uh, issues with reporters. How many times have you heard on the panels in the last couple of days how you cannot trust unembedded reporters because, or I'm sorry, embedded reporters. Because anytime you have a reporter on patrol with you, you will act differently. And for me, that just rang so true because we were briefed extensively on how to talk to reporters. We were constantly being told, if a reporter asks you how everything is, you just say good to go. And it doesn't matter what the actual situation that you're experiencing is, that you better say everything is okay. And um, you know, quite frankly, there were, there were many Marines that they would not allow uh, to talk to reporters. Our chemical suits that we were given, um, keep in mind during the invasion, the weapons of mass destruction was a very real threat. We know now that it was um, a lie sold to the world, but during that time, that was an extremely real threat to the Marines invading Baghdad. We, 24 hours outside of the city of Baghdad, were ordered to take off our chemical suits. Nobody has provided me with an adequate explanation on the discrepancies in intelligence about why we're being briefed that there is a threat in Baghdad of weapons of mass destruction with the Republican Guard lying in wait, and yet 24 hours outside of the city, we were told to remove our chemical suits. I failed to see the disconnect between the two. If we were told to remove our suits, then they must have known that there was no threat. Thank you. In closing, on a very personal note, I, I know this panel is, is called the breakdown of the military. And it's my position that this is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, <laughs> To me, it's, it's, this phenomenon that we're witnessing is actually a, a natural evolution. And any time you organize human beings to come together to use violence as a way of conflict resolution, you will have a breakdown of that organization. <laughs> you know, you cannot both prepare for peace or sorry, prepare for war and hope for peace. It does not work that way. You know, p peace is not a political process and it's certainly not a militaristic process. Um, to me, this war is just a symptom of something that's, that's much larger lurking in our society. Um, you know, and I really feel that that's the war within ourselves. Um, how we think, the language we use, the arguments we get in with friends and family. For me, what we see in Iraq is just merely an extension of that. It's merely a manifestation of the culture of violence that we cultivate here at home. The carnage in Iraq, to me, is just an extension of that anger, and it's, it's an issue that I, I struggle with personally on a daily basis. And I've committed myself to trying to work through this issue as openly and honestly as possible, to try to wake up to both my own suffering and the suffering of all of my fellow human beings. So, you know, let's be brutally honest. The Democrats aren't going to end the occupation. <laughs> Our leaders aren't going to end the occupation. It's going to be us that ends the occupation. Thank you. Thank you uh, for that testimony. <laughs>